Welcome and thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. We are the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DoD Information Analysis Centers operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DOD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. CSIAC serves as one of the premier information research partners and curators of technology advancements and trends for the cybersecurity and information systems community. As such, our organization supports those working in the cybersecurity and information systems domain of DOD research and engineering. We do so by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. With an understanding of the cybersecurity and information systems DOD research and engineering landscape, we provide research and analysis services. We help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoy this webinar presentation and that it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DOD cybersecurity and information systems research. Okay, good day, everyone. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me. Uh, thank you very much for tuning into today's webinar. Uh, just for a couple of administrative items real quick. Uh, the chat is open for everyone, uh, but the everybody's microphones are muted. Uh, so if you need to, uh, if you, you're free to chat, some, chat amongst yourselves, uh, chat to myself um, and uh, or the presenter, and um, we should be able to see it. But if you do have a specific question, uh, there should be a menu, kind of a three dot ellipses menu on the bottom right hand side next to the chat uh, that will open a Q&A. And if you have a specific question, uh, we ask that you post it in there. And at the end, I will read it to the presenter for, uh, for the Q&A session at the very end. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to go ahead and introduce today's presenter, who uh, I just uh, pass the presentation over to to you, uh, so you should be able to start sharing your screen. Um, but today's pres uh, presentation is is on the System Security Engineering Cyber Guidebook, and it is being presented by Katie Watmore, who is a systems engineer at the Cyber Resiliency Office for Weapon Systems at Wright Patterson Air Force Base, Ohio. Responsibilities of her current duty position include leading system security engineering team of diverse engineers computer scientists and acquisition security specialists to provide SSC guidance to the Department of the Air Force. She's responsible for the content within the DAF SSC Cyber Guidebook, as well as the technical content in associated training. So with that, uh, I can see your slides, Katie, and if you want, if you would like, you can take it away. All right, so hopefully you can, can you still see my slide? I had to switch back to unmute myself. Yep. I can, I can, I can say it. And All I can right, hear awesome. You. All right. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining. Um, during that intro video, it was really interesting hearing a bunch of the comments about collaboration and uh, eliminating redundancies and things like that, um, because that's exactly what we have tried to do uh, in developing the System Security Engineering Cyber Guidebook. So, um, hopefully, as I share with you about that today. Uh, that will shine through and um, hopefully you'll be able to see how you can use the information we have in the guidebook uh, in your day to day job. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is uh, if you were able to attend the webinar last month, um, you were able to hear about the cyber survivability endorsement implementation guide and the 10 cyber survivability attributes. Uh, what's really cool is that uh, this. This briefing builds off of that. Um, the requirements from the CSA, uh, CSAs are decomposed and actually translated into uh, system level requirements within the SSECG. So we'll get to that, but just wanted to kind of put big picture. Um, if you were here last month, that's how those things kind of tie in together. So 
Moving forward, if you have never heard of the CROWS, the Cyber Resiliency Office for Weapon Systems, uh, we've been around now for a little bit of time. Um, started back for during the, the cyber campaign plan um, and ultimately we're focused on how do we get, uh, you know, how do we get or improve weapon system cybersecurity? So from there, we established our mission, vision, and goals, which are, are still the same today. Um, ultimately, we want to increase the cyber resiliency for both the air and the space force by baking in and being able to bolt on uh, mitigated uh, vulner or mitigations for vulnerabilities. Um, and we want to do all of that by trying to change the culture of the Air Force and the Space Force by not thinking of cyber as something as an after the fact uh, problem that they have to address, rather as addressing it as part of just overall systems engineering, right? It's another discipline that falls underneath systems engineering. So uh, if you have any, any questions about the CROWS as a whole, uh, I can certainly try to answer those at an end at the end, but that just gives you some high level uh, overview of, of what it is that we're trying to do as an organization. So change the culture uh, and, and get things addressed as part of systems engineering. So why did we create a guidebook? Um, the reason we, we did this is because as we started to pull apart the problem, we found uh, just thousands and thousands of pages worth of policy and guidance that people in the program office are expected to do, uh, are you know um, required to do statutory, regulatory requirements, et cetera. And so what you see here on this slide is a summary uh, that's not all inclusive, but a summary of the, the big players um, that my team has gone through where we have uh, tried to consolidate and deconflict, um, streamline the redundant information and pull it all together in a best practices guidebook, which includes a process Katie, can you uh, can you hear me? It looks like your audio cut out. All right, apologies, everybody. Uh, it looks like we lost audio oh. from. The... What was that? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. I can hear you now. We lost you for uh, about thirty seconds there. Okay. Um... All right, so not sure where you lost me, but um, bottom line. Well, you, you cut out again. I'm, I'm they, sorry, there uh, might be a problem with your microphone. Is it still not working? I can hear you now, but it, it, cut, it, it cut out again just a minute ago, just a second ago. Hmm. I'm not getting any errors. Okay. I mean, I can hear you okay now, maybe. Try to push okay. it on. We'll see. So I will just go on to the next slide. So the system security engineering cyber guidebook, we just published version five in uh, February of this year. Version five, unfortunately, is still listed as distro D. Um, and so if you want a copy of that, you can request it. Um, but we're not able to publish it publicly yet um, because it's still going through the, the public affairs review. So um, hopefully we get that approval for version five. We did have a distro A approval, so you can uh, probably very easily find the, the version four guidebook out there. Um, if you do have access to the, the Air Force portal, you can go to the Crows Air Force portal page and version five is on that page. Uh, that is CAC enabled. Um, so anyways, what is the guidebook? Uh, the guidebook is, uh, it's, it's still pretty large. So if you open it for the first time, it is uh, approximately 500 pages or so. Um, but that, that's better than 20,000 plus pages of policy and guidance, right? 
Um, so how do, how do you use this 500 pages of information? Um, it's not meant to be a cover to cover read. Uh, the first 50 pages or so is the main body of the document. That's where we have the executive summary. That's where there is the uh, workflow process itself that includes a detailed work breakdown structure, which we'll get to. Um, and then from there, the, the bulk of the document are supplemental appendices. And I'll talk more about these appendices as we move forward. But the idea is that uh, given where you are at in the acquisition life cycle, you may be at a point where you need uh, guidance on writing requirements, in which case you would go to Appendix A. You may need guidance on how to do, um, you know, how to how to decompose your requirements more clearly from, you know, your CDD to uh, your your actual system level requirements, right? So how to, how to decompose that capability um, and maintain traceability, and that's where maybe Appendix C might come into play. Um, and so we'll talk about that as we move forward. But again, it's not meant to be a cover to cover read. It is meant to uh, go where you are at within your acquisition program and find out where you can jump in and start making the best use of these uh, recommendations and best practices. So this is just uh, a slide that highlights some of the collaboration and endorsements that we have through various organizations. Um, the SSE Cyber Guidebook was not put together just by the pros. We have had partnership with um, all of the uh, centers across the Air Force, as well as uh, Space Force, as well as NAVAIR, uh, their Cyber Warfare Department. We have also worked very closely with industry through NDIA, the System Security Engineering Subcommittee. Um, and then just, uh, what was it? Uh, I guess it's been a couple years now. Um, I guess this memo was re-signed out in 2019, um, but we, we got the memo uh, coming from the four uh, Air Force Center commanders saying that, you know, they encourage the use of the SSECG to make sure that that the RFP language is appropriate, uh, appropriately addresses system security engineering. So here is a snapshot of the workflow process itself. Um, and at a very high level, the next couple of slides, I'll walk through just kind of big chunks of it. So what you'll see over here on the left, this is where the bulk of the heavy lifting comes in. Uh, within the SSECG. Um, and that's because if you get your requirements on contract and you get your requirements right, then the rest of the things kind of fall into place because you have the requirements there. So we spend a lot of work uh, providing guidance on how to make sure that you understand your system, you understand the scope, you understand the boundary, um, and you can start applying system security engineering requirements to the appropriate areas of your system so that you're optimizing uh, your design solution, right? Because we all know that there's a, a trade space there um, between performance, schedule, budgeting, um, and then there's also, you know, size, weight, uh, you know, all those different constraints that we have to work within. And so um, this helps, this, this area of the guidance helps provide a way to, to basically have um, informed decision on, on the trade space and how to make sure that we're addressing the most important parts of our system. So as you go through this process, uh, as I mentioned, there's a work breakdown structure. So if you were all the way over here on the left and you were at the very first step, the very first step in this process says form a system security working group. Okay, so how do I do that? Well, you can go and look at the work breakdown structure and there's a, a, a table within the SSECG uh, and you can see the, the detailed information that we have in there. We have sub steps to those boxes uh, so 
Um, you can see the sub steps in there. There's a description of things that you can do. Uh, so for this, uh, for example, there's recommended uh, personnel to include in your working group if possible. There's artifacts that the step might inform. So uh, as you're forming your SSWG, that's gonna help populate some of your program protection plan. Um, and then there's also additional references there. So if you wanna go and try to read through the policies that relate to this particular step, uh, those are right there for you to take a look at as well. The other big thing with uh, this upfront section, um, Appendix A primarily applies to all of this upfront work, um, as well as some of the, the systems engineering work that we'll talk about in a little bit. But Appendix A addresses these, these areas seen here. Uh, the biggest thing to, to note is that there is tailorable uh, statement of work language. There is tailorable system requirements uh, language as well that ties back to or has been decomposed from the 10 cyber survivability attributes. Um, and then there's also a bunch of guidance on how to make sure our overall systems engineering type of documentation actually has system security engineering integrated throughout it. Um, so, for example, when you're looking at Appendix A and you go and you're, you're in Section 2 and you're looking at the, the SAW requirements, you're going to see sample language. Along with that sample language, you will see uh, Cedrils called out. So, for that paragraph A that you see on the right there, you see Cedril 1, Cedril 10 um, called out. At the very end of Appendix A, there is uh, an attachment that has a Cedril table in it. So it has the corresponding Cedrils by name for these paragraphs. It has the corresponding data item descriptions that can be used to put that Cedril on contract, has recommended delivery schedules, et cetera. Um, and here is a, a snapshot of that Cedril table. So, um, you can see that if you were in paragraph 2.3.2a, it called out Cedral 1. Cedral 1 is the program protection implementation plan. Uh, and so you can go and look up the data item description listed here. And as you're, you're filling out um, or you're getting all of the contractual documents prepared for your request for proposal, you can make sure you have all of that documented appropriately. Um, so I think there are approximately right now, um, maybe 40 Cedrils or so called out in the table. Again, it's tailorable. So, uh, you can choose which ones are going to bring the biggest value to your program. Uh, but they're at least all presented for the system requirements. There is, uh, an attachment within Appendix A, and there's an embedded Excel sheet. Within that Excel sheet, there are multiple tabs at the bottom, which you can see kind of highlighted here in red. The very first tab is called the, the System Requirements Worksheet, which is uh, the tab that has um, very high level requirements. Um, I think there's like maybe, I don't know, there's maybe like 20 or so on that first tab. Um, I forget the actual number off the top of my head, um, but they're higher level requirements. And then what you see after that are uh, additional tabs that, that focus on each individual CSA. So for example, if you know that you need to address CSA 1, you could click on CSA 1 and there are the parent requirements that are listed on the system requirements worksheet, but then there are also decomposed requirements that take it a little bit further down, a little bit more detail. And so you can look at those as well. Um, again, these are tailorable. So as you, as you look at them, as you read through them, uh, a lot of times you're probably gonna need to add additional information um, 
to them to make them applicable to your weapon system. Uh, but it at least gets you thinking um, kind of in the right direction and, and get those first steps taken. Um, one thing worth noting is that as you are working through the SSECG process, all of the areas highlighted here in, in or shaded in that gray, grayish blue color, um, these are the areas of your program protection plan that the SSECG process is going to help you populate. So it's either going to, um, so for like section five, threats and vulnerabilities and countermeasures, there are very specific sections within the SSECG that call out uh, getting threat information, intel information, um, and, and using that to understand your vulnerabilities uh, so that you can do risk assessments. And when you do risk assessments, then that leads to coming up with mitigations and mitigations are just countermeasures, right? Um, so that's just one example. So all of these sections within the PPP are uh, populated by, by following this process. So moving forward, if you look at the right side of the workflow, this is really where we get into, I think, where most of us spend our day to day, and that's just living, living the systems engineering acquisition lifecycle. So whether it's going from one systems engineering tech review to another, whether it's, um, you know, going from milestone to milestone, um, if you're doing any kind of, of the adaptive acquisition framework, um, th that's where all of that falls in and going through all of that in order to get to your verification validation and then ultimately into fielding. Um, so that that's what happens, um, I guess, let me go back. That's what happens in that area. Um, I don't have uh, slides on the details there, but what I will say is that uh, within Appendix A, there is information on uh, entrance criteria that should be included in uh, your RFP as far as the systems engineering technical reviews go. And what this does is it helps ensure that as you're approaching these technical reviews, which are essentially, you know, decision points, um, you know, to proceed on and, and continue development, um, whether or not you've actually addressed the, the system security engineering concerns uh, adequately. So um, by, by putting that in there, that makes sure that uh, the program will address those instead of waiting until it's too far down the line um, and, and more costly. One thing you'll see is that this process is very heavy on risk assessments, um, and that is by design. So um, you want to do risk assessments early, often throughout uh, the life cycle, so that as the design is maturing, as maybe the threat or intel information uh, changes, because we all know that cyber is a very dynamic environment to be working in, um, we're staying up to date and we're staying as informed in our decision making as possible. Um, ultimately trying to reduce the risk um, and, and what that means is going to be dependent upon your program, right? Like what an acceptable level of risk is, is, is going to be dependent on the program, dependent on the mission, uh, et cetera. So I added this slide in uh, kind of at the last minute. Um, a lot of people, when I, I talk about the SSECG process, uh, bring up RMF. Um, and the purpose of this slide is at a very high level um, to show you that by doing the steps within the SSECG, just like for the program protection plan, you are going to be generating the data needed to uh, develop your authority to operate package, your ATO package. So what that means is that if you are doing this process along the way, when the time comes to actually submit your ATO package, it's not going to be scrambling and trying to pull together documents and make sure that you have everything documented appropriately because you will have gone through 
and done the analyses, done the risk assessments, everything will have been documented along the way. And so at that point in time, it's really just going to be compiling the data in whatever format your authorizing official needs to see it in. Um, another thing I want to talk about is Appendix C and D within the SSE Cyber Guidebook. Um, these two appendices are, in my opinion, really, really important and actually are going to kind of lead into the, the next month's uh, webinar, which is going to be provided by Ms. Sarah Standard and focus on cyber T&E. Um, but Appendix C and D are focused on the, the functional threat analysis, which the main purpose here is to decompose the system starting all the way up at the mission. Um, and, and there's been a lot of discussion on what is the mission? Is it, you know, big Air Force mission or is it platform mission? And, and that's really at the program level, that's for you to decide where you want to um, start your, your breakdown. But being able to look at that mission, trace that mission to the capabilities within your CDD, which then should be traced to the CSAs that, that uh, are in the CSEIG. Um, from there, you're going to want to decompose those capabilities into actual system requirements. And from your system requirements, right, you're gonna have different levels of fidelity as your design matures, and you're gonna go from uh, you know, functional requirements to actually allocated system requirements, et cetera. But if you follow the process outlined in Appendix C, you are going to have that traceability um, from whatever the lowest level you are currently at all the way back up to the mission. You know, it's going to be a bi-directional traceability. And that's really important because, uh, one, it ensures, you know, that we're not implementing uh, cyber countermeasures just because it's a good idea. We're, we're implementing them because they have impact to our overall mission. Um, and so uh, the work done in Appendix C also leads into having the information needed for your attack path analysis. So that moves into Appendix D. Um, Appendix D takes the information that was developed in the functional threat analysis, and it starts to look at how the system could be attacked, right? Um, how, how entry could be gained into the system where there's potential vulnerabilities, et cetera. Um, now, Appendix C and D are pretty important because uh, as, the, as the test community um, has mandated the use of mission-based cyber risk assessments, Appendix C and D fulfill uh, the intent of a mission risk cyber-based assessment and MBCRA. So um, if you are following the guidebook and you're doing these things, then guess what? By the time you get to DT, uh, you're going to have the information needed about your system so that the developmental testers are going to be able to uh, move forward with the tests that, that have been planned for your system as opposed to trying to go back and, and rediscover the, the information that they need. Um, so with that, um, that, that is a, I, I sped through that brief. Um, I'm hoping to have some questions and discussions. Um, so with that, I will pause and see if there are any questions so far. Yes, yes, uh, so. There are several questions in the chat, and uh, uh, so I'll go through them. And it looks like some of your colleagues have been answering some of the questions. Uh, and one thing I will point out is that uh, Catherine Holder posted that if anybody would like the uh, SSECG version 5 sent to them, uh, they can email her and her email address. She posted in the chat, but it's Catherine, K-A-T-H-R-Y-N dot Holder. H O L D E R dot four, the number four at us dot af dot mil. So that's Catherine dot holder dot four at us dot af dot mil. Uh, you can send her a request for a copy of version five, and as long as uh, you're able to receive it, she will send it to you via DoD safe. Um, 
So a few of the other questions that came in that I, I don't think have been answered in the chat. Uh, uh, first, one is uh, simply, is the Army using this SSECG? Um, so good question. Um, we, so let's see, am I, I, I am still presenting. Um, so the, uh, this, sorry, this will be a, a little bit of a detour to answer. So back in 2018, the government audit agency basically came out with a report that said none of the services are addressing cybersecurity for weapon systems within their requirements documents. And so there was a go do uh, out of that GAO report for all of the services to basically start addressing that. What we've done in the SSECG is the Air Force's response to that initial GAO report. In 2021, they did a follow on report um, and you can read some of the excerpts here. Um, but basically what came out was that uh, still to date, the Crows and the Air Force are really the only service that has provided this level of specific guidance. And they actually recommended that all of the sister services do something similar. Um, what I can say is since 2021 and, and even prior to, we have shared our guidebook with the Army, with the Navy. Um, and the Navy is standing up some very similar processes within uh, their, their service. I believe the Army is as well. Um, but but what I will say is that even though the SSECG uh, has been developed by the Department of the Air Force, uh, there may be some, I guess, what I'll call Air Force isms in there, right? Like some Air Force specific things. But for the most part, um, it is written at a high enough level that it could be applicable to any of the services. Um, so, you know, some of the stuff that was derived from Air Force instructions may or may not be applicable to the Army. Um, but as far as the, the tailorable requirements and things like that go, uh, the Army can certainly, um, you know, take it and, and borrow what they want from the SSECG as they move forward. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question, there was some people discussing this in the chat, so but I'm not 100% sure if the question itself was answered. So uh, the question is, do you offer a list of known vulnerabilities for a set of technologies often used in solutions? Wow, that is an excellent question. Um, so I, I do not think at this time, we have a list like that that exists. What I, what I do know is that uh, part of our organization, part of Crows, we have um, a team that looks at, uh, I guess, kind of just generic uh, vulnerabilities that could apply like um, to multiple weapon systems. Right. And from there, we go, we go out and we research mitigations. And so we do have a, a document um, called the mitigations handbook that is on the classified side. And if you're interested in that, um, again, as you reach out to Kate for the SSECG, uh, throw that request in there as well. And then Kate, we can, um, we can compile a list of names that would like to see uh, that document, the mitigations handbook, and we can get that over to uh, the team to get that supplied to them. Um, that's that's where we're at today. And I know Joe typed in um, about the the vulnerabilities database, um, but as far as crows goes we don't have something that we maintain for that. Okay, great, thank you. Um, let's see, another question. Uh, who do you see being the billet assigned to do these tasks? The ISSM, 
a dedicated SSE, uh, the PPS. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm not sure of all the acronyms, so I, I hope they're familiar to you. Sure. Um, so that's an excellent question. Um, and again, uh, coming from um, the, at least for the Department of the Air Force, part of CROWS is, has actually provided that manpower to our program offices through what we call our cyber focus teams, our CFTs. So within each program office, we have uh, positioned a cyber focus team lead as well as other cyber focus team members to be that cyber SME to be able to support programs as they navigate through uh, their, their cyber terrain for lack of better words. Um, now, that being said, not everybody is going to have a, a cyber focus team that's readily available, right? Sometimes smaller programs may not have the help that they need. Um, and, and likewise, maybe larger programs are like, hey, we, we got this under control. We're doing it by ourselves. Um, in which case, an ISM could be somebody that does this. It could be uh, if, you, if your program has a system security engineer actually uh, billeted for the program. Um, they are somebody that could be doing it, uh, but I think in, in standard engineering fashion, I'll give you the it depends answer. Um, so hopefully that helps. And if you need more uh, information on the Crows cyber focus teams, um, again, please feel free to reach out to me and I will help get you the information that you need based on either what programs you support or um, anything like that. All right, great. And uh, another question, uh, do you have an overall mapping from RMF to the guidebook? Uh, I work in an area that doesn't use the same procurement processes. I would like to see how we can apply portions of the guidebook to our processes. Um, yes, give me just a minute. I am going to share a different screen. Um, this is the one I wanna share. Okay, so um, this is the slide that I had up earlier. Um, and what I want to point out is that within the SSECG Appendix F, I, I'm sorry, I did not talk about Appendix F and it's one of my favorites because um, Appendix F is the relationship to other processes. So Appendix F will discuss how by doing the SSECG, you're going to meet uh, test and evaluation needs. By doing the SSCCG, you're going to meet these RMF needs. And we actually have the discussion on um, really how and why those things, uh, you know, are in alignment or complementary of one another. So here, what I did was I, I really just kind of tried to break down that uh, section of Appendix F that talks about RMF and the SSCCG and pull it out into some slide pictures. So uh, this is the slide that you saw before. Within Appendix F, we also have this slide, which is just the RMF process, right? This, as a refresher, is just the SSECG process. And then what we have uh, in very, very explicit detail, this is obviously an eye chart, um, but this is a table that we have that's, that's much more readable in the guidebook itself that goes through every one of those boxes on the the slide two that I showed you for RMF and traces them to um, a step within our work breakdown structure in the SSECG. What I point out on this slide is that there are only these, these two steps or these, sorry, these three steps um, that do not have a direct chase trace to the SSECG. Um, but I think that uh, some of that P7, I think um, actually that we might need to look at that one a little bit more closely um, because I do believe we have some stuff in there for uh, continuous monitoring. Um, but so hopefully if you take a look at that section that that might help you with that traceability question. All right, great. Um, another couple questions. Um, is there anyone from the space that you are working with? Um, 
Yes. So we do have, um, I do not have names off the top of my head, um, but we do have representatives um, that we work with out at space. We are in the process of trying to hire uh, cyber focus team members to directly support the Space Force. Um, we have, uh, let's see, I believe uh, Kate is actually, Ms. Holder is actually meeting with SSC, the Space Systems Command, uh, a couple of folks tomorrow to give them kind of the same rundown of, of what the guidebook is and um, how the crows can can help them out. So um, if there are more specific questions on how space can get help from crows, uh, please reach out to me directly and um, we can have that follow on conversation. Wonderful. Uh, another question. Are you seeing any work in the leverage or I'm sorry, are you seeing any work to leverage MBSE slash DE, bottle based systems engineering slash digital engineering to support FTA and attack path analysis? Absolutely. Um, so the Crows has been funding the development of two separate tools that will directly uh, impact that area. Uh, so one is the Assurant tool and the other one is the CSA tool. Uh, the CSA tool is, is very near and dear to my heart because I've been working with that development team for a couple of years now. Um, and, and the tool has really started to, to grow into something that's gonna be very beneficial. Um, that tool starts by um, actually taking all of the, the CSA language, all of the requirements that are in the SSECG, um, NIST controls, uh, basically they, they spent uh, a lot of time pulling in all of the, the backbone um, information needed to build a model uh, from a, an SSE perspective of your system um, so that you can have that requirements traceability. So the CSA tool will provide uh, basically the, the SSE inputs to your request for proposal package. Um, if you would like a demonstration on the CSA tool, uh, I can get with the program manager of, of that and, and we can schedule um, some kind of demonstration. They're, they're always willing to give demonstrations of the tool. Um, but from there, uh, my so we actually have the, the CSA and the Assurance team um, are doing a, a workshop this week uh, to work on integration stuff. So from there, uh, we are in the process of making sure that the CSA tool and the Assurance tool can talk to one another because ideally the model built in uh, CSA tool will be able to be exported into Assurance and then the Assurance tool will able to be able to run um, an attack path analysis to be able to help identify those potential vulnerabilities within the system. Um, we are working to have that communication of Assurant and CSA bi-directional so that uh, say we run an analysis in Assurant, um, that Assurant can then uh, export its findings back out to CSA and CSA can you know, make whatever requirements, modifications if necessary, um, and, and that we can then export it back, run the analysis again, see if we've done some mitigation. So um, that is right now uh, our biggest focus in the MBSE uh, DE arena um, as far as it, it relates to cyber. Great. Um, ne next question, and we've still got a few more coming in. So. Um, are ATOs and CRAs transferable between all defense branches or are risk assessments environment dependent? Um, I don't know if I am qualified to answer that question. Um, that would be, honestly, I think that would be up to the authorizing officials. So like if you were to do, say you're working, I guess, like a joint program, right? Um, if you were to do like the processes within the SSECG, would the Navy accept that risk assessment? 
Um, I would I would tend to believe if you can show the the sound engineering and due diligence behind the assessment that yes it it would be accepted. Um, but I don't know that uh, for fact. So that would be something that you would have to probably follow up with your AOs on. All right, uh, this question, I, you may have addressed it in another answer, but uh, I'll ask it anyway. Do you address how to define measurable requirements in the requirements de decomposition? To an extent. So uh, recall, I did say that these um, requirements are uh, tailorable. So um, that's really where the measurable part comes in. So um, like if you're going to say there's a requirement for um, restoring back to a known baseline or, or like, so one, you detect an anomaly, uh, you have the, the requirement in there to detect anomalies. Okay, great. Um, there's probably some kind of time requirement that you would want associated with that, right? And so that's where your program uh, specifics are going to come in. And, and that's where I believe uh, Ms. Standard's brief next month is kind of going to pick up from where this briefing is leaving off. Okay, great. Uh, next question is simply, do you use EMAS? Yes, EMAS is uh, called out in the SSECG. Um, and I know that that uh, our cyber focus teams are aware of how to use EMAS, et cetera. Okay, and then uh, the next kind of two part question comes from somebody who asked the person that asked the previous question on uh, mapping from RMF to the guidebook. Uh, he asked, how about mapping how the NIST controls are accounted for? I see how some are accounted for, but not others. And can you share the more detailed slides with the RMF mapping? Uh, yes, I can share those slides. Um, and I will, uh, what I'll probably do is send those to Phil and let Phil figure out how to send those out. Um, if that's all right, um, that, that'll work. Yep. Okay. So, um, let's see, uh, mapping back to the NIST controls. Yes. Um, so what we did when we wrote the system requirements, um, those requirements were written. It's been, it's been quite a few years now, cause we've spent the last couple of years developing other content within the SSECG. So when those requirements were first written, we were using NIST uh, 800-53 version four. I know version five is out there now, um, but what we did was we used the uh, aircraft overlay for the NIST controls. We looked at um, the requirements that were on or the controls that were called out on that aircraft overlay. And then we pulled those requirements or we looked at those controls within NIST and we translated those requirements into or we translated those controls into actual requirements. It is important to note that those controls are always supposed to be translated into requirements language. Unfortunately, uh, I think we've gotten in bad practice of not doing that. Um, but within the Excel sheet, if you scroll over to the right, um, you'll see the mapping to what NIST control that satisfies. Now, going back to that CSA tool that I was just talking about, if you're using that tool, the mapping is already done in there for you. So if you select a control, it's going to pop out the requirement that's corresponding to it. If you select a requirement, it's going to pop out and show you what control that correlates to. Okay. Um, the next question simply does your guide apply to industrial control systems? Um, so it was developed specifically for weapon systems. That being said, uh, I don't think there's anything that precludes it from not being used for those kind of systems.
again, it's all tailorable. Okay, great. Um, I think I got all the questions that are in there uh, right now. Um, I'll just point out and get to give people an extra minute if there is a last minute question. Uh, the slides, a few people asked about where the slides are available. If you go to the CSIAC.org website, uh, click on webinars, find today's webinar, the slides are there. And then when the, uh, when the webinar goes up on YouTube, should be there by the end of this week. Uh, you can also get the YouTube link from that very same uh, website or just go to the CSI YouTube channel. Um, uh, there is one more question. Super set Lynn wallet. Oh, did I miss a question up here? Okay, so there was one more question. I, I, I must have. Uh, uh, missed this question. Would you say that you have an accumulate? You have accumulated and documented the superset of activities that a program should do during the system life cycle. Was that your intent? Can Can you ask that again? Uh, the way it reads is: Would you say that you have accumulated and documented the superset of activities that a program should do during the system life cycle? Was that your intent? Um, I don't know if I would say it's a superset. I would say it's a comprehensive uh, set of activities that um, if you were going through the most rigorous, you know, standard waterfall approached development cycle that you should do. That being said, if you're going through uh, a DevSecOps or you're going through some kind of accelerated acquisition, et cetera, uh, there are ways to tailor the process uh, to go faster. Um, but at the same time, we have documented, um, I guess what, what we would recommend as uh, a bare minimum of things to do dependent upon which pathway you're going. Um, so I hope that helps answer. Yeah, uh, yes, and then uh, one last question. Will this be used for a new or an existing program or both? It can be used for all of the above. Um, and that's why what's, uh, what's interesting about when you look at um, the workflow process itself, you will see that it's not aligned to milestones. And the reason we did that is because Regardless of if you're a brand new system, you're um, an upgrade to a system, you're like a, a 1067 where you're, you know, bolting something on. Uh, you still need to go through all of those upfront steps of understanding if it's a brand new system, obviously you have a, a lot to, to understand and, and uncover there. If you're bolting something on, you still need to understand what is your system? What is your system boundary? How does this impact? You know, if I bolt this on here, what does that do to the rest of the system? And so you still have to go through all of that um, analysis and understanding of your system. You still have to go through putting stuff on contract uh, and, and you still have to go through, you know, doing whatever kind of reviews to get to decision points. And so that's why um, we kind of set set the process up in the way that we did. All right, great. Well, thank you so much, Katie. That that looks like it's the last of the questions. Uh, and I thank you for the wonderful brief. Um, I'll I'll send you the the chat history just so you can see the number of people that said what an outstanding brief you, you provided. Uh, this was great. Uh, great with the question, question and answer portion. So thank you so much. And thank you to everybody that joined us today. Uh, I'll go ahead and close it out here. I've already told people how to get to the slides and to the YouTube video. So again, enjoy the rest of your day and enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you.